This happened over 20 years ago. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve, and my mother's family used to hold a large celebration at my aunt's house in Estacada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting with my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. Therefore, I'd be driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so. I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest, and parts of it are unlit. But nothing to fear I grew up in this area, so I knew this road like the back of my hand. The both of us were just driving and talking away, just two young lovers making the most of our moment together. There is a portion of the highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road are thick forests. There are no lights. The only thing we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drive down the hill, cross the bridge, and uphill through more forest. It's as the highway starts to flatten out that it happens, something sprints across the road so suddenly that I almost hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes. I turned to my girlfriend and asked her if she saw it. She confirmed that she had, but she couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote, as they are a fairly common sight in this area. But something felt off about it. Whatever it was that ran in front of the car disappeared into the woods next to the road. Coyotes don't usually just dart out in front of cars. Not like that anyway. So for some reason, I decided to check it out. I turned the car around and switched on the high beams to better light up the forest in which this thing had vanished. I step out of the car and walk towards the woods. I don't see anything. But now it feels like perhaps I'd made a grave error. My heart is pounding and the hairs on the back of my neck are standing at full attention. But I still don't see anything unusual in the trees. Suddenly the car's horn blasts. It's not a beep, beep that you'd get if, say, your driver or passenger wanted you to hurry up and get in the car. No, this was a long blaring beep. I walk back into the car and ask my girlfriend why she leaned on the horn like that. She said nothing, instead, she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I looked over in that direction, and that's when I saw it. Surely this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It was a man. He was completely naked. His skin was covered in dirt and mud. And in one of his hands, he was holding a hatchet. He looked back at us. And then he smiled and waved to us just before turning around and walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there. Once we were safely driving again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I was trying to look for the man in the area he initially vanished in, he circled back around and came out from another spot in the forest, beyond my car headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye. And that's when she saw him. Before she honked the horn, he was walking towards me, his hatchet raised as if making to strike me. We called the authorities once we got safely back home. But they never found anybody, or they did and just didn't tell us. But the officer we spoke to explained his theory. The man was obviously looking to ambush unsuspecting loan travelers for Lord only knows what reason. We all agreed that my girlfriend's quick thinking saved my life as it let my potential killer know that I wasn't alone out there. I moved back into the area recently. So I now drive that highway often. No naked hatchet man sightings yet. But I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant now. Especially near Deep Creek. I'm a male and my older sister needed to do the rest of her Christmas shopping today and had a list of places she wanted to go that included our local mall in Northern Virginia. While I was accompanying her because she's a very petite person and people normally find her to be attractive so she gets the typical teenage or early 20 year old guy that so smoothly walks past us more than once for no reason. She also needed ideas on what to get me so I was supposed to point out some stuff for her. Being that I recently got my new holster and own my concealed carry license, I decided I would carry today. 
Well, we'd looked at a couple of stores, Hot Topic, American Eagle, etc. We were running out of places to look and I admittedly hadn't given her very many options for gifts when we decided to go to Spencer's because hey, they have t-shirts and some throwbacks to my childhood like classic Nickelodeon stuff. Well, we're in the back of the store looking at t-shirts, having no such luck at finding anything I'm liking or that is in my size, when this guy in maybe his late 30s or early 40s, relatively short dark hair, and a long goatee, average build, maybe 5 foot 8 or so in height comes right next to us and starts looking at the same stuff. This alone isn't very suspicious, granted we're the only two people near the back of the store, but there's plenty of merchandise so whatever, and he's just carrying a small coffee so normal enough. He then looks at me and says, they got a lot of stuff in this store, which if you've been to Spencer's you'll know they also sell adult items in the back of the store, so I just say yeah and we keep looking. Well this guy is not really looking at merchandise anymore, but weirdly looking at my sister and I, which I tribute to another guy finding my sister attractive so no big deal. We walk away, going around this rack of clearance shirts and whatnot and he follows, literally right on our tails all the way around this rack of clothing. By now I'm creeped out so I'm keeping an eye on him in my hand, which normally is just sitting at my side to cover my gun that happens to be slightly sticking out the bottom of my shirt, has now only come resting on the bottom of my holster. My sister is quite obviously creeped out by this guy now and I have to admit even though I'm 5 foot 10, 215 pounds, I'm weirded out by him at least, maybe that's the paranoia of having law enforcement family members, but something just did not feel right. So we look at each other and she says, okay, are you ready to leave? To which I said yeah and pointed towards the front of the store where all the employees and customers were. As we're walking away our way, I hear someone say, hey man coming from behind me, which I know is this creepy guy. Well, I don't really want to talk to him after he's made me uncomfortable so we keep walking. With my sister probably a good five feet in front of me because I know if anything I'm not letting him be between me and her. This lack of response does not stop him so yet again I hear a hey man from behind me to which I turn slightly, my holster side away from him to see his hand outstretched towards me like he wanted to shake. Now despite understanding what this gesture means I said, what, because I don't really see a need to shake hands with this guy and he responds with well it was nice to meet you anyways, which wouldn't be a very creepy statement if it weren't for the fact that we literally did not talk at all other than the one comment he had made before. My choice of response of now, nah, I'm good, man did not sit well with this guy. He then decided to say, yeah well f you too, man was an appropriate response, which didn't faze me as I had already turned around to walk away. I guess he had hoped I'd turn around and say something because when I didn't he followed up with an f you, you bald headed mother freaker. While this small altercation was taking place, my sister was doing what our original plan was and walking towards the exit, the distance between us increased so she was unaware until the last insult, which was yelled at me. She whips around not knowing what the hell is going on and looks to me asking what. I responded with just keep walking knowing it wasn't worth the effort to engage this now hostile creeper, that if he came out of the store after us then I would escalate accordingly, which he thankfully did not. We immediately went to a different store in the mall where we had a second to process what the hell happened. One of the thoughts that came to my head about what he was planning is that he wanted to shake my hand in an attempt to get my hand to hold me in place while he threw whatever was in that cup in my face to either take my gun if he somehow saw it, grab my sister's purse, or something that I'm too non-creeper to comprehend. But I'm glad I didn't find out. Needless to say my adrenaline was pumping for several minutes afterwards and I was constantly looking over my shoulder until we left the mall a few minutes later. Alright, here we go. Nearly a year ago now, on Christmas I was at my dad's with some of my siblings. We celebrated Christmas and then after dinner my dad headed off to be with his girlfriend at her apartment. Left in the house were my 16-year-old uncle, my 16-year older brother, me who was 15, and the youngest who was a toddler. I woke up early the next morning, the day after Christmas, and sat on the floor beside an outlet on my tablet. Everyone else was still sleeping, and then I heard banging on the back door. I thought it was my dad coming back, but the banging got louder and went on for too long. For lack of a better term, I disassociated, didn't know what to do, and couldn't move until I heard the back door break. 
I had been paranoid about home invasion due to our area in the city before, but I had no idea what to do and just stood there in shock. I put down my tablet and picked up a nearby flashlight, I think to throw at whoever broke in. When the back door had given out, I heard him go quickly through the downstairs, stomp up the stairs, and then he was right outside of the door of the room I was in. The man opened the door, turned left, and then turned right, where he saw me sitting on the floor, beside the outlet less than three feet away from him. He was taller than my dad, and wore completely black and a ski mask. He held a big, rusty-ish crowbar that had a blue handle. He was wide, and looked on the older side. I took a small breath, and screamed louder than I ever have, and I held it for at least 20 seconds. Once I screamed, he screamed a bit too, and then ran downstairs and out of the house. I went to the top of the staircase, after he was already down them and out the hallway, and I yelled please leave. As loud as I had screamed less than a second before. Looking back, asking a house invader to leave is useless, cause he already was leaving, and also because he broke I in, but I wasn't thinking the best. My screaming woke up my uncle and my older brother. I wasn't wearing pants, so I put pants on quicker than I ever have, while telling my older brother what just happened as he was half awake and confused. I ran downstairs and my uncle had just come from his room in the basement. I quickly told him someone had broken in and left after I screamed. He already had a knife and told me to grab one too. I did and after making sure the robber had left the house and checking quickly on the toddler who was somehow still sleeping. My uncle told me to guard the back door and stab anyone who comes through while he checked the area outside slash the neighborhood to see if the robber was gone or where he went. I held the knife and stood beside the broken back door knowing if someone came back I couldn't do anything as I have never fought and I'm a child holding a kitchen knife. So I just held the knife in hopes they wouldn't come back and they didn't. My uncle came back and said they must have had a driver since no way could he get away that fast on foot. None of us had phones so my older brother called my dad over Instagram on a tablet to tell him what happened. We explained what happened and when dad was 10 minutes away via duct car and he hung up. While we all sat and waited for my dad, we talked and realized this was likely all planned. The invader came in when there was no car in the drive away and after entering he ran directly upstairs ignoring the new Christmas presents, an alcohol collection, and even two gaming consoles smack dab in the middle of the living room that he ran through. He went directly for my dad's room where me and my older brother were. My dad collects valuable shoes and has some expensive watches he keeps in his closet and only someone friends with my dad who'd been in the house before could have done it and knew the right place to go. When my dad came back he asked me over and over about how the intruder looked and I told him again and again while he and my uncle tried to think of which friend it could have been. I was the only one who saw the guy and had been less than three feet away from me. I was in direct physical danger from some stranger I'd ever met. We didn't call the cops, as the police in our area and city are known for being more than unhelpful. As Christmas is getting closer again, I'm worried about being back there around the same time the person broke in. I've had a harder time sleeping, and I've been more paranoid. I understand I was and am very, very lucky that I wasn't hurt and all we got was a broken back door, but I still honestly hate the person who broke in. I hope wherever he is, nobody likes him. So, house invader who was thankfully scared of a random 15-year-old screaming. Let's not meet. Now, I drive for Lyft while putting myself through trade school. I drive for other similar companies, but that's besides the point. I have many horror stories from those as well, but I'll tell those another time. It was Christmas Eve 2020. I was out running Lyft for a few hours before heading to my mom's house with my new baby and wife. Nothing special going on for the night. Just the usual. I got a ride request. It was a pick up from this kind of lower income apartment complex. No big deal. I arrive and I find my passenger. He has all his belongings, several boxes of stuff. Now, my car is a 2006 Chevy Impala, so it's not too big. We get all his stuff loaded up, barely, and are on our way. During the ride, he's crying saying his girlfriend was cheating on him, and he had walked in on them earlier that night. 
he couldn't stay there because it was her name on the lease. So, I was taking him to a hotel. Now, in my city, we have a street that is well known for having vices. Hookers, drugs, gangs, weapons, and shady motels, the usuals. We get to the motel, he asks me to wait for him to check in and get his key. No problem, man, I say. I'll confess, I break the rules a little when it comes to lift. I have a gun hidden in a concealed holster secured to the underside of my driver's seat for protection. Reason being, driving Lyft and other contract apps, I've had knives and guns pulled on me, as well as people have tried to fight me, rob me, and all kinds of other things. But, like I said, I'll save those stories for another time. This motel was on that street I mentioned before. Homeless people were everywhere. There was a dude on the far corner of the complex that still had a needle in his arm, passed out against the building, and I'm a big fan of true crime and horror narration, so I'm on edge. He gets his key, the whole motel is ground level, so to help the guy out I drive to his door. As I mentioned before, he had a lot of stuff. So, I started to help him unload his stuff. While on my second trip getting stuff, I saw a guy come out of a room just to the south of my car, followed by two ladies. They came up to the room I was next to, one of the ladies pounded on the door, then opened it. That's when I saw the guy raise a freaking shotgun out of his long coat, storm into the room, with the two ladies following him and slamming the door behind them. Following that I heard a lot of yelling and shouting, I was just waiting for shots to ring out. Out of nowhere my passenger came up behind me, I can take this man, go ahead and take off. Have a Merry Christmas. And he gave me a cash tip. I didn't even notice he took the boxes out of my hands or slid a $5 bill in my pocket. I was frozen. I knew what may have been going down in that room. I had to leave or at least get to where I could get my gun. I know the guy and both ladies saw me and I know they knew I saw the gun. I had to get out of there. You know, no witnesses. I got in my car and sped away quickly. I got a block or so away and called the cops. I gave them every detail. After I got off the phone with the police, I signed out a lift. I hadn't made much money, but I was done. I got a call later that night. The cops investigated. They never found the gunmen or the women. They never answered the door I saw them come out of. And the occupants of the room they went into said nothing had happened and that I was full of it. Well, I know what I saw. So, to the gunman I saw with the shotgun, who I'm sure was making a statement to someone about a debt, let's not meet again. My fiancé and I threw a dinner party one time to celebrate his mom completing chemo. I hired a caterer. We were expecting 25 friends and family, so it was more than the kitchenette of our single-story ranch house could handle. We'd also only just moved in, so didn't have a lot of cooking staples. The caterer said he'd bring everything 75% done, but he needed to finish off some dishes in our kitchen. I told him that was fine as long as he was finished by 5 p.m. because the kitchen is centrally located and we'd prefer everyone be finished before the guests arrive due to the intimate nature of the occasion. He said that would be fine. He arrived as scheduled at 12 p.m., we gave him until 5 o'clock and the guests weren't supposed to be arriving until 6 o'clock, so it's plenty of time. He smelled like actual dog crap, but his accent sounded European, so I thought maybe he just didn't believe in deodorant. It was more than a sweat smell though, it smelled like a sunbaked diaper, and that made me uneasy because he was going to be preparing food for sick and young kids. I just made sure he washed his hands and then left him to his own devices worrying I was being presumptuous. Throughout the entire process, he keeps pulling me aside to ask me questions and have me taste things. I was super busy because my husband had to work during the day, pick up the surprise guest right after, so setting up the deck, decorating, putting together the slideshow equipment, coordinating the surprise guest, and just a million other little details. So every 10 minutes he asked things like, do you prefer this with paprika or without, and which is fine. Whatever you think. It was definitely getting old. When he was still there at 5.45, after two gentle reminders, I flat out told him I needed him completely out by 6 o'clock no matter what. 
He apologized and said there had been a delay because our oven wouldn't stay up to temperature. I'd never had a problem with our oven, but I figured he's the professional. Maybe it was a subtle problem. A little before six o'clock rolls around, a few of our friends start trickling in. I decide to tell him whatever's done is done, and whatever isn't he should just put in the fridge. But he's nowhere to be found. I go out on the deck to ask my friends if they'd seen him, and he's out there, alcoholic beverage in hand, out of his chef whites, and now in a t-shirt and jeans, mingling with my friends. I walked out just in time for him to introduce himself to my cousin-in-law as a good friend of mine. Nope. Too weird for me. I met him in person for the first time barely six hours ago. I told him he needed to leave now. So he goes inside to Gadget's his bag and makes a beeline for my bedroom. I'm taken aback. I say, excuse me? Where are you going? And he says to change. So, first of all, we have a guest bathroom which is clearly visible. Second, why can't you wear a t-shirt and jeans to go home? I tell him I'm not comfortable with him going in my room, but he insists it'll only be a second, goes in, and shuts and locks the door. I couldn't even get a word out before he went in and felt helpless. I was going outside to ask one of my friends to help me usher him out, but at that point my fiancé got there, with my aunt-in-law. I had to explain the situation to him, nearly in tears at that point, and he was like, what? Why did he go into the bedroom? So my fiancé proceeds to pound on the door. And the caterer came out, still in a t-shirt and jeans. My fiancé said, you shouldn't be in there. You need to leave. And the caterer said, excuse me, but this is not your house, it is not up to you to decide. And my 6 foot 4 inches, 260 pound fiancé tells him, yes, actually, it is his house and puts a hand on his back and guides him to the door. The caterer says, I thought the woman lived here alone. And he replies, no, my fiancé lives here with me. And the caterer goes nuts. He turns to me and screams, you lied to me, you whore. I have no clue what he's talking about. He starts yelling about how I lead him on and calling me a whore some more. I don't know who he thought the man in the pictures with me around the house was. So my fiancé says, oh no, you won't talk that way in my house. Find the door. And the caterer goes in the kitchen and starts throwing the trays of food out of the refrigerator and on the floor. At that point my fiancé realized two of his brothers had come in and were on the deck. He signaled to them and they came inside and he basically said, this guy is harassing my fiancé. Since they're a family of all boys and my fiancé is the first to get married, they don't get to flex their protective muscles too often and jumped at the chance to toss this guy out. The party then went on as planned, but I insisted we just order pizza and throw out all the food he made. My fiancé and friends kept saying, isn't that a bit much? But I was insistent. We went out late drinking with his brothers and got home around 3.30 a.m. and passed out in our room. At around 5 a.m., I was awakened to the sound of the door opening. I figure either we forgot to lock the door in our drunken stupor, it blew open, or one of his family forgot their keys, or someone in the house didn't want to wake us. But his parents never ever let themselves in when they knew we are home, his brother had even more to drink than we did, and was definitely not awake or driving around at 5 a.m. It wasn't nearly windy enough for the door to have blown open, it had been tranquil all night. So I wake up my fiancé and whisper, someone just came in the house. He replied saying, probably my brother left his wallet or something. I figure I'm being paranoid and try to put it to rest when I hear a loud crash sound. With that, my fiancé was up and on his feet in one movement. He told me to lock myself in the closet and call 911 while he went and looked around. As I was pulling out my phone we heard in that distinct accent, is that you? Hello? and I realize it's just this insane caterer. I'm not worried about this caterer physically overpowering my fiancé, or me for that matter, so I charge right out there. The caterer is shirtless and clearly on something. He's taking the pictures that are of just me off the wall and holding several in his arms already. He lunges towards me when he sees me. My fiancé gets between me and him and I call 911. 
Fiancé tells him cops have been called and it is in his best interest to get off the property. Caterer says no. I have to make sure my wife is okay. I replied, what? Why wouldn't I be okay? And my fiancé rightfully says not to engage with him and feed into it. My fiancé stays between me and him while I climb out a window. He watches as the caterer throws photos of us on the floor. My fiancé didn't want to subdue or touch him in any way so the caterer couldn't make any assault claims. He's begun to destroy our kitchen at this point and when the cops come in he had a butcher knife in his hand. My fiancé considered going for the gun safe when he first got the knife since we live in a stand-your-ground state, but he decided the situation was hectic enough without introducing a firearm. Caterer doesn't obey police orders to drop his weapon and he says he isn't leaving without me, so they taste him. It's lucky for him he only got tossed and he didn't antagonize my husband into squashing him. As he's let out in cuffs, he's shouting how he and I are in love and it figures I chose a macho thug over a sweet, sensitive artist like him. He then continues saying that all women are whores, etc. He continues on this tirade the entire time police are reading him his rights. The police ask us to do an inventory of the house and see if anything's missing or damaged besides what we witnessed him do. We go around and there's nothing. But then I remember he was in our room yesterday and went through the room. All my panties from the dirty laundry hamper were gone and my vibrator had been moved from where I kept it. We were so freaked out in the aftermath that we replaced all our kitchenware, toothbrushes, sent our sheets to be professionally cleaned, and had a cleaning crew do a deep clean on the whole house. He sent me a letter from prison that thankfully my husband intercepted because I was still recovering from the whole thing. We gave it to police who helped us get issued a no-contact order. He was sentenced to three years in prison five years ago, so he's out by now, but thankfully, we did not meet. This story takes place in 2014. I was 17 at the time, and I would take the bus to and from school. The bus stop was on the main road, so I would have to walk a few blocks to get to my apartment complex. I was walking home from school one day and this Honda van pulled over. A girl comes out and introduces herself. She tells me she's new to the area and wants to make new friends. I gave her my number and quickly we made plans to have dinner. Maybe a day or two later she picks me up in the same van, but this time with a man who was driving and also another young female. She did not mention these other two people, but I didn't think much of it. There were a lot of red flags I ignored. I was young and naive. The man was doing all the talking during our dinner and the other two girls were quiet. Another red flag. He put on this fake nice tone in his voice the whole time. Asking me questions. Then he started getting weird like saying how he can read minds and started telling me all this information he knew about me. I had no idea how he knew all that so I believed him. After dinner we stopped by their house, which was in a whole other city than where my apartment is. Remember how the girl told me that she stayed by me? Another red flag. It was a really nice house though, and he had a Mercedes in the driveway. My young mind was intrigued. He told me how they're all roommates and hustle together. He took me back home that night by himself and was trying to convince me to be a part of their lifestyle. A couple days after at this point, I'm only texting the man. The girl barely held any conversation with me. But he tricked me into thinking he was this super nice person. He asked me to pack some clothes and spend the night and I agreed. After hours of talking, he convinced me to leave my mom's house and stay with them. I texted my mom that I was moving out and as I was already almost 18, she was okay with it for some reason. This is when crap hit the fan. He was not the nice charming person that I had met. Only after I moved in did he tell me that those girls were sex workers and that I would become one too when I turned 18. He started telling me how to do my hair and how to dress. He gave me a whole new phone and number with a tracking app on it. I wasn't allowed to contact my mother, any of my family, or friends. He would keep insisting he could read my mind and hear my thoughts, even the smallest mistakes I made he would punish me for it. He duct-taped my hands and feet, 
tossed my private parts, stabbed me with screwdrivers, threw me from the second floor by one leg, punched me until I passed out, and did it all with a grin on his face. He enjoyed hurting me. I will never forget the look on his face. I can't explain it, it's like his eyes literally turn black. Holy crap. This was real. I thought only people were like this in movies. People are really out here torturing people. He also made me watch those gore videos of people getting decapitated and the most disgusting videos of people getting tortured I'd ever seen. All while holding a knife to my neck. He would also have sex with me every day when the girls went to work at the hotels. He would lie and say I was the only one he was intimate with and that I was special. He told me if I ever tried to leave or if I ever told anyone where I was he would kill me and them. He would go into detail about exactly how he wanted to kill me and where he would put my body. One day he had me lay down and beat me so badly in my stomach while his leg was choking me over my neck. I blacked out and woke up so confused. My vision was tunneled. I had a huge knot in the back of my head. I couldn't even stand up straight. I had no idea what else he did to me while I was passed out. But at that point, I told myself this man was going to kill me. I'd rather risk him killing me if I get caught trying to leave than spending any more time with this monster. I didn't care about the threats anymore. I wanted to be gone. I didn't sleep that night. I waited until I heard him snoring really loud and I made a run for it. I took nothing, not even the phone because it had a tracker on it. And I made it. By the grace of God. I still didn't speak to my mother for about three months out of fear. I was right because he went looking for me at her apartment. I don't even know how he knew where she lived. Eventually, I reached out to her and she had filed a missing persons report. She was crying because she thought I was murdered. I went on with my life. I did end up stripping and I still do sometimes. Fast forward to 2017. One of the girls was smart because somehow she set him up. Now that son of a gun is rotting in prison now. I found out because the detectives were looking for me. As a 16-year-old girl, incidents like this scare me crapless. For some background, I'm 5 feet 3 inches, skinny, and I have long black hair and for some reason this always gets creepers to latch onto me. Anyways, me, my sister, and my best friend had plans to go out and grab dinner and then go hit the roller skating rink downtown. After dinner we had an hour to kill before the rink opened, and so we journeyed around the downtown area and then we hit up the rink soon after. All was well, I grabbed my skates, I started skating, but after I got the hang of how the hell to use shoes with wheels, I was really exhausted and wanted water. Wheeling into the food and drink area, I rolled up to the counter and there was already a man standing there waiting for his order. I ordered my water and while I was waiting he struck up a conversation about roller skating. I thought nothing of it until he offered to help me out and look me up and down, literally licking and biting his lip right in front of me. He looked about the age of 30 at least and I don't look much older than I actually am. Weirded out, I said nothing and rolled away, maybe it was just something I saw in my head but I still wanted to have a fun night. A few minutes rolled by when he glides up next to me and asks my age. I told him to guess. He said 17 and I turned 17 in about three weeks so I told him he was right. That's a good age. Before I could reply he rolled ahead further. He would occasionally roll by me and call me by my name and give me tips to improve my skating performance. Nothing too creepy but still freaking weird. When I asked his age, he said he was 23, but after this guy looks way older than 23, he looked like he could be my dad. The moment I got fed up was when I was grabbing my sister a tampon from her bag and this guy followed me and said, You know Olivia, you're really beautiful especially for a 17 year old. I replied with a dry eye try, to which he replied, Well it works, before I left to save my sister from the bloody claws of death. I'm standing with my best friend and my sister in the snacking area. He rolls up behind me, looks me up and down and says, rather loudly as he licks and bites his lips again, getting a little hot in here, trying to show off more. He literally freaking winked. That is when I lost my freaking cool. You know I'm barely 17, right? 
I said, giving him a dirty ass look and rolling into the rink to get away. What do you mean I know you're 17? He asked while rolling around beside me. Don't you think I'm young? I replied and this creep says a little. I gave him the dirtiest look I could. After that I wanted to go home. My best friend fell four times. My sister got her period. I wanted to just forget the day. As I handed him my roller skates I complained and the guy there got the manager who was this lovely lady who gave me and my group four free passes to come back and they never expire. She was absolutely amazing and was lovely and understood the whole situation. As I was about to walk out, I noticed he was constantly staring at me with a bunch of people sitting around him at his table. He was sitting with people, but he looked a little awkward, but they looked like his friends. I walked up to this guy's table, slammed my water bottle down, and proceeded to yell, Listen here creep, next time you hit on someone, make sure they're not someone who could be the age of your kid, thanks for ruining my night you freaking creep. Dead silence as I looked him in the eyes, as I left I slammed the door on my way out. I hope that embarrassed him, and I sincerely hope he never has a daughter, because someone that creepy, unashamed, and to the point that even the manager noticed his creepy behavior. It's scary to think about what he's capable of doing. In June of this year, I moved out of my parents' apartment as I finally got a steady job and longed for some sort of freedom. I looked for apartments that were affordable in my city and found one that's a two or three minute walk from my parents' apartment. To me it was perfect, I'd get to live alone, my parents would still be nearby so I could visit them whenever I wanted or pop in to have breakfast with them. The apartment itself is great, it's not really much to look at but for a single male it's more than enough. My apartment has a long corridor connecting each room together from the sides, with my front door being at the start of the corridor. My bedroom is the second room on the left, but since the walls are pretty thin you can literally hear people in the apartment complex walking, talking, etc. from my bedroom, and any room for that matter. Last week I came home from the pub after meeting up with a few friends, it wasn't really late, only around 10pm. I had the day off, so I took a shower and hopped into bed to watch Netflix. It was probably around midnight when I heard a faint knock coming from the front door. I stopped the show that I was watching, listened for a minute or so, and just thought that it was my mind playing tricks on me. I continued watching Netflix when once again I heard a two-motion knock on my door. I sat up from bed, went to the door to look through the peephole, and sure enough it was pitch black. I once again shrugged it off and went back to my room, but before I could even sit down properly I heard a slightly louder knock at the door. At this point, I thought it was my friends playing a prank on me, so I called my friend and asked if he was knocking on my door, and if he was it wasn't amusing. He paused for a second and said, dude I'm at home, I have to be up at like 7.30. I believed him and hung up the phone. I was talking pretty loudly so whoever was knocking probably heard me, and as soon as I hung up, I heard another knock. At this point, I was pretty pissed off, so I walked to the door, looked through the peephole, and saw nothing. I then unlocked the door to take a peek, saw nothing, closed the door, and then locked it. Me being angry and a bit intoxicated, I decided to wait and catch whoever was knocking, so I spent a solid 10 minutes silently looking through the peephole, before being a bit startled as someone put their hand over the peephole and knocked again. I immediately started unlocking the door and ran out to the apartment hall, I heard someone booking it down the steps, and heard him lean against the wall as his jacket shrugged the wall. I ran a few steps down before realizing that whoever this is was waiting behind the corner to get the jump on me. I hurried back inside and called the cops. They were there within a few minutes. They scanned the building in the street but couldn't find anyone. They told me that it could just be some kids pulling a prank and to never run after someone. They kept a patrol car around the entire night and the knocking stopped. It could have been some kids being dumb. But the part that gave me the freaking creeps was the fact that whoever it was ran down the stairs and stopped behind the corner, he didn't keep running. If it were some pranksters, I find it more likely that they would have just booked it outside. As I said it's been a week and the knocking stopped, it kept me on edge for a few days because I just expected to be jumped by someone when walking into my apartment, but so far nothing has come of it. I've let it go at this point and just hope that it won't happen again. 
I moved in with my elderly grandmother a few months ago because I got a new job down the street from her house and she said she'd be happy to have me stay with her. Some context for this story, I used to come visit my grandmother about one weekend a month. About a year ago while I was visiting, one of her neighbors a couple houses down came to talk to us while we were sitting on the front porch. She informed us that the adult son of the man who lived across the street from them was mentally ill and a peeping Tom. Supposedly, he would come stand in this neighbor's yard and just stare into her windows. She got her husband to yell at him, and when he kept doing it, they eventually called the cops. My grandmother remarked that she had seen the cops at this man's house for years and that supposedly a single dad lived there with this adult son who struggled to manage his mental problems. Flash forward to a couple weeks ago. Now living with my grandmother full time, I got home after dark a couple weeks ago and the front door was cracked open. My grandmother is a bit of a safety freak so she always has her doors locked. I was nervous but tried to hope for the best thinking my grandmother had forgotten to close the door on the way in with groceries. I went to her room and she said she was certain she locked the door. I tried not to worry about it since nothing had been moved or stolen. The next day when I got home her car door was cracked open. At this point I assumed both instances were her and that she was just being forgetful however she's never left either of these things open before. Well tonight my grandmother and I are going out for dinner and therefore I am the one who locked the front door on the way out. She has a door knob lock and a deadbolt lock above it. I distinctly remember struggling to lock the deadbolt. They both use the same key. Sometimes you have to shimmy the door to get the deadbolt to lock, but I got sick of trying and just left it unlocked, satisfied with the doorknob being locked. Funnily enough, as I walked away from the door I thought to myself, I hope no one breaks in. Well, we get back from dinner and I go to unlock the doorknob and to my surprise the door wouldn't open because the deadbolt had somehow been locked. It was at that moment I immediately knew someone had been in the house while we were gone and locked the deadbolt back when they left. Once again, nothing had been moved or stolen. The creepy part is that this person is intentionally leaving the doors open and locking back locks that had not been locked on purpose just to creep us out. And he was obviously watching us out his windows to see when we left tonight. I feel certain that it is this mentally ill man who must have gotten hold of a key that my grandmother hid under a mat or something. Why would anyone else do this? If it was a robber, they would have taken something. Reminds me of the first season of American Horror Story where Jessica Lange's autistic daughter would just randomly sneak into Connie Britton's house. I'm just hoping that if it is this guy down the street that he is as harmless as that American Horror Story character. I'm going to get the locks changed as soon as possible and install a ring doorbell camera. What I'm most nervous about is that once I get the locks changed this guy will know we're onto them and may get mad because they won't get access to their twisted pastime anymore. We live in a gun friendly state but I'm afraid of what this guy may do in retaliation. The neighbor who had the peeping Tom incident literally called the cops on him and she's still alive so I just hope he leaves us alone and doesn't bother us anymore. In 2018, I lived with my partner and my German Shepherd in the Humboldt Park neighborhood of Chicago. I was 33 years old and our apartment was a fourth floor walk-up unit, very typical low-budget Chicago rental in a changing neighborhood. The layout of our building is going to matter to this story. Our building had a total of 12 units, mine and the three below me had a shared front entrance, and the other eight units were through a second entrance. All 12 apartments had connected back porches and stairs that shared a walkway to a rear gate, which led to an alley. From the front stairwell, there are windows on each landing to the back porches, so you can see the back door of my apartment when standing at the front door through that window. We had good relations with our neighbors, especially those that lived directly below us and shared our front door. This was the thing that saved all three of us, my partner, my dog, and me. My partner was in a touring band at the time and would leave for weekends or weeks at a time, and it was a scary thing for me because I was assaulted and stalked by an ex in my teens and twenties. I always worried something would tip him off and head start stalking me again. A little less than a month before a two-week tour my partner had scheduled, I received a creepy Facebook message from that stalker ex from yet another new account. 
about a week after that my car was broken into. The glove box was emptied, things were thrown around, but the only thing that was taken was a bag of dog treats. I had about $20 in change in the compartment between the seats, and they left the money. I was on high alert at that point, and very scared about the time I'd be alone during the tour. My partner was kind of irritated with me and the situation. He felt that it was too last minute to cancel, especially over what amounted to a bad feeling and a few isolated things that weren't direct threats. And truthfully, car break-ins are very, very common in Chicago. It's happened to me like 15 times, and the police usually do the reports over the phone and don't even come to the scene. What I found really strange was that the thief didn't take the money. There was a homeless man who had started camping on the boulevard nearby recently. My partner left for his tour. I set up cameras and bought door braces for my front and back doors. I became completely nocturnal, unable to sleep at night. My poor dog developed diarrhea, maybe because she was picking up on my stress level. It meant that I was taking her down all four flights of stairs for her to go blast her bowels six or seven times a night. I had the distinct prickly crawling sensation of being watched when I would take her out. But I couldn't tell what was genuine and what was my own fear and paranoia. Her diarrhea lasted an unusually long time, like three or four days. I was going in and out the main door a lot, feeling very scared, and I noticed that some of my neighbors wouldn't pull the door all the way closed, so the lock engaged. I mentioned it to my downstairs neighbor one day, including that I was extra careful because of the stalker. He was supportive, said he'd mention it to the other neighbors if he saw them, and I noticed that the door was locked more frequently after that. My partner came home at about 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. At about 8.30 a.m. that morning, my first floor neighbor's place was burglarized. He was a metalhead dude who collected instruments, sold weed, psychedelics, and lived alone. I guess he went out for breakfast and he left his door unlocked while he was gone. Someone had come in, eaten the leftovers in his fridge, took a coat, a pair of boots, took his college diploma, but left $500 in the same cabinet. They left all the expensive musical instruments and mixing equipment, left the drugs, but did take a set of keys. The keys were to the first floor apartment and a master key for the front door and the back gate. My neighbors ran into each other right after the break-in and the second floor neighbor said to tell me because I had a stalker. So my metal head neighbor came up to let me know what had happened. My partner had just gotten home from his tour when he knocked at the front door. I jumped out of my skin but looked through the peephole, recognized him, and the three of us stood on the stairs at my front door while he told us about the break-in. We jabberjawed for a while, about 15 to 20 minutes. While we were talking we heard the front door open and close below us but thought nothing of it. Then we saw a man climbing up my back porch steps to my back door through the window. There was no other apartment he could have been going to, and he had to walk past all 11 more accessible units on his way to mine. He was not my stalker and I did not recognize him, but his image is burned in my mind. He was wearing flashy black and white high-top sneakers, his black coat was oversized and hanging off his shoulders. We locked eyes through the window and he froze halfway up the stairs to my back porch. He slowly took a cell phone and called someone as he slowly turned around halfway up the steps. He walked back down the stairs in artificially slow motion, like he was pretending to be nonchalant, and then bolted into a sprint as soon as he hit the porch below mine. My neighbor ran downstairs and dialed 911. My partner and I ran through the apartment to the back porch and saw a sedan and a windowless van pull out from the sketchy building two doors down. Both cars floored it out of the alley. We didn't get the plates. But the cops said it wouldn't have mattered there wasn't any crime committed and nothing concrete to justify stopping them. They very condescendingly explained this to me as they took my statement later. My neighbor is the one who actually made the call and has the police report, my partner and I were just considered witnesses. For a long time the thing that scared me the most was the tool that my neighbor found when he went running downstairs. It was a 2 by 4 piece of wood, cut to about 2 feet, but about 6 inches of it had been made into a handle. It looked like a paddle and for a long time I couldn't figure out what it was, but I'm pretty sure it was a ram for the door jam locks. 
When I looked at my door afterward, it looked like the frame had been repaired. Like it had been broken open before. It seems like they used the one master key to place their ram, get somebody at the back door to catch me if I tried to run out that way, and somebody else was going to come back around since they only had one key, and they'd break in my front door and go forward with whatever they had planned. When we caught them before they could catch me unaware, they seemed to have aborted the plan. I suspect they'd been watching me, especially while I was taking out my dog, and figured that I was alone. It was pure coincidence that my partner had gotten home 30 minutes before all this. I feel that we all could have been horribly injured or worse had we been trapped inside and they had gotten the jump on us. Nothing else ever came of it, except that my landlord refused to change the locks, but he did agree to let us out of our lease. I moved out of Chicago and now have added a younger dog I'm training to do some bite work. My house is surrounded by cameras and floodlights and wingnut neighbors. So whoever was on my back porch and whatever they had planned, let's not meet.